my name is Philip Morgan uh, and I'm going to be talking on Chronicles and Colleges, Constructing the Image of the Mortimers in the uh, Middle Ages. And I suppose what I'm really doing is looking at the ways in which the Mortimers presented their genealogy in textual form and whether or not looking at their final foundation of a college says something different to the message that's presented in genealogies. like to, uh, to talk about is, is, is kind of reflective, I suppose, on uh, the nature of um, history writing as it relates particularly um, to families um, and how families um, see themselves. So I'll, I'll say a little about um, each of these uh, four headings um, during the course. Uh, the reason for putting this synopsis is as you get bored, of course, you have an estimate of what's left um, to come. And you think, oh my God, we can't be talking very long about this. Um, each of these headings is, I think, reasonably um, self explanatory. And the core of it, of course, is those chronicles that are associated with the Mortimers um, and to a degree uh, with Wigmore itself. When one talks about family history, uh, of course, we think of it as a reasonably benign form of enterprise. There can't be um, anything uh, seriously wrong with the practice of uh, family history. Um, unless, of course, you're Jewish and you live in Germany in the 1930s and there is a Reichskommissar uh, Commissioner for Genealogy. Um, this is the first commission who was sacked um, in the mid-1930s. I don't have a photograph of his successor, uh, Kurt Meyer, um, who was, of course, a historian um, as well. Um, so my first kind of health warning is that family history is not benign and never has been uh, benign. Um, it's always been um, a trap for uh, the unwary, um, as indeed um, St Paul uh, famously um, said um, in the letter to, uh, to Timothy. Except, of course, that those of you who know St Paul's letter to Timothy will know that he congratulates Timothy at the beginning on his conversion to Christianity and following the example of his mother and grandmother. So he starts with a genealogical um, statement. So um, that's, as it were, by way of, of introduction. But let's as it were, plunge right in to what might be called the Mortimer family capital. Not the manuscript that comes from um, Chicago, uh, but this manuscript, uh, which is currently in uh, New Zealand. Um, yeah, I did go see this one as well. Um, <laughs> This is how dull historians' holiday snaps can be. <laughs> uh, this manuscript, which is at the University of, of Christchurch, is, is um, University of Canterbury Manuscript 1. It is a genealogical role, and it's worth saying at the beginning that the way in which family history was presented um, in the late Middle Ages in particular was commonly in the form of a role. Um, so you could imagine something um, looking like uh, an early medieval pipe roll that you would roll out um, across a table. Early commentators thought that they were actually used in this fashion, so that they'd be, as it were, brought out at dinner and as the plates were pushed to one side, you'd, you'd push your roll down the table and you'd argue about uh, particular uh, matters of, uh, of genealogy. Well, this genealogical role is a role which, uh, which deals with the royal family. So the central line, that is everybody uh, that you can see uh, coming down here. Uh, so we have here Henry V. But it, this is an odd role. So Henry VI is this little circle here. <laughs> and all this lot are the Mortimer, so everybody above um, this yellow line. So this role was constructed 
uh, for a family interested in the royal genealogy, but also interested in the relationship of other aristocratic families uh, to that same uh, genealogy. But it's a negotiable genealogy. So here we have the explanation. So we've been looking at this section here and this area in blue. Well, even as you're reading, you don't, in a sense, have to read what's there. You look at it, and those of you who've done your own family history, you can't have produced a genealogical table that looked any messier than this. <laughs> This is a genealogy that's been altered in its production. So Michael was talking about the propaganda value um, and in early medieval historical writing, thinking that because of closed circles, um, that's somewhat lessened. In this kind of circle, it can be somewhat heightened. In other words, genealogy is something to which you return or which you revisit because it has a changing currency in the current market. And what's been happening here, as the text on uh, the left tells you, um, is that a scribe who has acquired this role or inherited this role decides that he doesn't quite agree with its contents. So he tells you that this central blue and red line is unjust or incorrect. And the reason for that is that the Lancastrian cause, that's Henry VI and his uh, predecessors, are of course usurpers. Um, so this is, in the context of a 15th century um, production, a Yorkist view of the royal genealogy. Why are Mortimer's there? Now you'll notice there are these sorts of Clapham Junction, um, Spaghetti Junction, um, whatever, um, sort of arrangements that are going on here. So this is a way of accommodating the Mortimers. These are additions. And bear in mind, of course, that by the 15th century, or at least after 1425, there are no Mortimers of Wigmore because the family has died out in the male line. But their capital, their genealogical capital, continues to have purchase. So if we remind ourselves, this is Chris Gibbon Wilson's little uh, summary uh, genealogy, if we remind ourselves of why the Yorkists in the 15th century might be interested in the Mortimer genealogy, um, it goes back, of course, um, to the children of Edward III. The Black Prince who predeceases his father, Richard II who dies without heirs, the usurper's line, according to our genealogy, and then, of course, the line of Lionel of Clarence, Edward III's second son, which joins the line of uh, the Earls of March, the Mortimers. So the Mortimer capital um, in Yorkist claims in the 15th century results entirely uh, from the female marriages um, of the royal family into the house of Mortimer. It gives, as it were, it touches uh, the family with a tincture of royalty uh, themselves. And it's that to which, in our role, um, the Yorkist compiler has returned. So in that section uh, that's describing um, this marriage, we get, so here is a little circle for Roger, um, Earl of March, Rogerus Colomés Marchier, um, and then the text which describes the claim of the Yorkists um, to uh, their connection. In other words, Mortimer genealogical capital goes up. Oops. So it's referring to Richard, Duke of York's connections to the Mortimer, and therefore the connections back to Lionel of Clarence. Now this kind of enterprise, of course, was common in the Middle Ages. It happened most famously when the King of Scots had the misfortune to fall off his horse in the late 13th century, um, leaving only a poor strip of a girl um, in Norway as the heir to the kingdom, uh, who dies on the voyage back 
um, to Scotland and inaugurates the great cause, which is this search um, for uh, the rightful heir to uh, the Kingdom of Scotland, uh, which leads to the Scottish Wars of Independence, etc., etc. So this kind of reverse looking at genealogy, looking at previous family histories, is a common historical uh, enterprise, and it reaches a sort of form in these role chronicles of um, the 15th century um, in particular. Just to make the point um, that they are common, uh, let me give you uh, another example. Well, uh, let me finish off with this because I've forgotten I put these. Uh, and so this is the whole thing looking um, at its messy best. So here is the Yorkist king. So this is Edward the fourth down the bottom. All of it being justified by the connections to the Mortimers. Mm -hmm. Here is the false Lancastrian line. And here is the railway accident <laughs> where the two genealogies, as it were, um, intersect with each other. And you'll notice that the scribe uh, compiler has very carefully <laughs> scraped away on the manuscript. great thing about vellum, of course, is that you can scrape off the top. And we'll see a lot of this kind of enterprise uh, in a minute. So here is Henry V, here is Henry VI, and um, here are the buffers. Um, as the new HS2 has <laughs> ploughed its way down the royal uh, genealogy. This lot on the right are, of course, all of the illegitimate heirs of John of Gaunt's marriage with Catherine Swinford, so the Beauforts and all of that um, sort of, uh, of crowd. But let's have a look at another example, just to make the point that it's so ubiquitous. This was a, a less exciting holiday um, in Manchester, <laughs> which wasn't a holiday, of course, at all, because that's where I'm from anyway. Um, but this is uh, a similar sort of genealogical role. Again, this one's associated with the Della Poole family. Um, and it's, it's one that deals with a rather handsome uh, Richard III uh, in this portrait triangle here. Here are Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. Now, when you look at these portrait triangles with a sort of knowing eye, you'll see that there is something a little peculiar about Edward IV. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Woodville. That is to say, a bit like the causes of the Crimean War, Russia is too big and pointing in the direction of India. Well, you'll notice that Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville are looking to one side. And what they're looking at, of course, is the genealogy that's on the left-hand side of the manuscript as you look at it. And the genealogy that's on the left-hand side is this line, which is the Della Poole family. And the Earl of Lincoln, whose Randall is here, you don't need to be able to read it, just see how the thing is working. You'll notice that it brushes the royal trunk. It comes just nicely, you know, it's in suggestive proximity. So this is part of the Della Poole claim, as it were, to um, to having, a, again, a tincture of royalty. Except, of course, that the world falls apart. Because after Bosworth, there is this newcomer. And here, drawn in at the last minute, <laughs> is this terrible long black line that goes all the way back to um, Catherine de Valois, that's Henry V's widow's, uh, marriage to Edward Tudor um, and the origins, which has to be accommodated um, in all of that. And you'll notice, that the genealogy is left so that it may be continued. This was probably drawn up in a Delapool uh, family context before they'd abandoned their claims to the throne. In other words, while they were still present um, and still being um, considered. So I wanted to do that sort of thing as a kind of background to the manuscript that we're going to look at, which is the Mortimer uh, Chronicles and how they work. Um, because I think they belong to similar kinds of, of contexts. Uh, this is Chris Gibbon Wilson's um, summary of um, the Mortimer Chronicles as they currently survive um, in various manuscripts uh, around the place. I've tweaked it a little uh, following Ian Mortimer's 
um, Ian Mortimer brackets, no relation, close brackets, as uh, one always has to describe him. Um, which is five little groups. I obviously won't say anything at all about Adam Musk, um, because um, Helen, the third speaker, will say something about that. Um, I will say most about this one, which is Chicago Manuscript 224. But there are other manuscripts which have been carefully um, delineated by Chris in terms of their focus. They belong both to um, a regional focus, that is those uh, which are connected particularly with Ludlow. They belong equally to uh, a monastic focus, that's those which are connected to Wigmore Abbey. But they also belong to a family uh, context, uh, which is those which are connected with the Mortimers themselves. The study of these manuscripts is an interesting story in itself. I couldn't resist putting in the next slide simply because one of the things which I think are crucial about family chronicles in the late Middle Ages is their connection to crisis. That they are frequently compiled during periods of crisis. Those of you who are familiar with the genealogy of the Mortimers in the 14th century will know that they are if not the unluckiest aristocratic family of the period, then they have a claim to being in the top five. They're not quite as unlucky as the Staffords, but it's a near thing. They die young, they fall off things, they catch diseases, uh, they choose the wrong side, etc. And all of that points to this continuous sort of sense of crisis. It means frequently that chronicles are compiled under the patronage of women. So I think when we come to think who the compilers of these things are, they may well be men, as we will see, but their patron is likely to be a woman. So I think we should probably be looking at a Mortimer woman as the guiding force behind uh, some of these enterprises. And it's fitting, therefore, that the first student to study um, the Mortimer Chronicle seriously in the modern period uh, was Mary Elizabeth uh, Giffin, um, who did um, a PhD in 1939, that's how far back one has to go for her study. Her PhD is almost never cited. Um, it's in the University of Chicago Library, and to my shame, when I went to look at the manuscript, I didn't look at the thesis at the same time. She wrote a little summary for the National Library of Wales in 1952, and at the same time deposited microfilms of the Chronicle in the various libraries connected to other Mortimer manuscripts. So there was one at the Bodley, uh, one in Cambridge, one at Aberystwyth, uh, and one at the John Rylands. And most scholars, up to and including Chris Gim Wilson, looked at the microfilms rather than going to Chicago to look at the Chronicle um, itself. It's now digitised, so you can see it yourself on the web. Um, so much for my expensive uh, flight. <laughs> my daily bus ride through um, the interesting bits of Chicago. Uh, Mary Giffen retired in 1962. She said that her retirement plan was to write the big book on the Mortimers. Um, she was also going to learn Persian because she was going to take up a teaching job at the University of Tehran um, in the 1960s. Um, I don't know how the Persian went, but the big book on the Mortimers never happened, um, sadly. But her scholarship is meticulous, and I think um, it's important to recognise it. Uh, not least because uh, there was a little group of women uh, working at places like Vassa um, in uh, the pre-war and immediate post-war period. Cora Schofield is a famous uh, late medieval historian who was also at Vassa at the same sort of time. And women are important both in the modern writing of the history of the Mortimers and, I suspect, in uh, the medieval writing of the So let's look at, um, at the Chicago uh, manuscript and its different uh, little bits, um, so to speak. It's a composite manuscript. It starts off with a prologue which is about Wigmore Abbey. Um, and it actually starts here. Ici commence le prologue sur un bref treatise. Here is the prologue to a short treatise, a short writing um, translation is at the top, um, of how the Abbey of Wigmore was first founded. This is a conventional way, and it's the place in which family history and monastic history intersect. 
a house right in the history of its own foundation, but inevitably, therefore, the history of its patrons. And 14th century examples of this are quite common. There's a famous one uh, from Staffordshire, close to where I work, um, at the Abbey at Croxton, uh, which, amongst other things, celebrates the Verdon family, the Anglo-Irish lords who were lords in, um, in Midland, England, but also in Trim um, in the North of Ireland. Um, and this is how it's done. Also contains the last words of Simon de Montfort, just picking up some of Michael's slides, uh, the only recorded version of the last words uh, of Simon de Montfort, which come, I think, from a, um, an Earl of Lancaster um, affinity. So this is, is how the chronicle, uh, as it were, starts. So it starts with uh, Wigmore Abbey. It then has a Latin chronicle. I didn't make this up, that's what it says. <laughs> Those of you that can read the first line of the chronicle, that's what it says. Um, so this is a brute um, chronicle, um, a Latin brute chronicle. That's the foundation um, of, uh, of Britain from uh, Brutus. Uh, there are versions that start with Noah, um, other versions that start with, with later things. Um, and many of them start, as this one does, with um, a description, a geographical description um, of, uh, of the British Isles. Um, and it's only then that we get, as it were, the Mortimer uh, Chronicle, which looks very different. Now, most people who've used this historically have made use of the transcript that was done in the 1680s by Sir William Dugdale, so in the aftermath of the collapse of monasticism um, in England and the dissolution of monastic libraries, uh, people like Dugdale, um, a century later, were beginning to collect um, antiquities and he published the text of the Morton Chronicle. The problem that you will see instantly is that this is a mix of Tree of Jesse, that's what Chris Given Wilson calls it, a mix of Tree of Jesse sort of genealogy with bits of text added both within the Randalls and in the interstices. So what Dugdale makes look like a coherent linear text is in fact him deciding that that bit is followed by that bit and that bit. In other words, do you read left to right, right to left, up and down, or whatever. So it's problematic. Dugdale also omits quite a number of passages uh, during the course of um, the writing. This, of course, is the bit that we've already seen. That is to say, here is Edward of Windsor. That is to say, Edward III. And here are his children. So here is the Prince of Wales. And you'll notice that... The Mortimer, so here is Roger, Earl of March. Here is Richard II. So it puts the Mortimers, as it were, on a par because it's part of that claim. Like our previous genealogies, it's been altered. So you'll notice here, this is um, the Randall for Elizabeth Mortimer, who, who marries Henry Percy. Um, the son of the Earl of Northumberland, um, and this Randall is for their heirs. Now, if we're looking for a date, we have several dates for the, as it were, the composite bits of this chronicle. The Wigmore bits are much earlier, probably from the mid-13th century, but these bits are mostly from the 1380s and the 1390s. That is to say, at the very point when the Mortimers have been designated not officially, but kind of in a sort of politicising fashion by Richard II as his designated heirs. Uh, so they become, as it were, um, the putative kings. And the argument has always been, this is not anything novel or, or mine, Chris Gibbon Wilson mentions it, other people have, have picked it up a long time ago. The whole of the family genealogy articulates the royalism of the Mortimers, their claims to status um, connected uh, to the royal family. Um, like other chronicles, 
The text is curt and terse. This is not Matthew Parrish writing. There's no Ciceronian style um, in any of this. This is dump de dump de dump Things happen and so on. Little explanations um, which actually um, do. There are lengthier bits in different places in the manuscript. This is the end of the royal genealogy because, of course, in the manuscript there is a Mortimer genealogy but also a royal genealogy. For obvious reasons, you put yourself together. So, um, have I told you about the time that I met the Prince of Wales? <laughs> Which I haven't. But, of course, it, it works just by... Um, that sort of percent. This is the end of uh, the genealogy. This is Henry IV, this one, and the last text in um, that bit of the genealogy is a narrative, in fact, of the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403, and it gives us the terminus ad quem for that bit of the chronicle. So this Mortimer chronicle, this Mortimer manuscript, looks to be being put together in the mid-1390s perhaps finishing around and about 1403, but then with additions for another decade. So right at the central period of Mortimer crisis, because they're all dropping like flies at that point, but also crisis in the sense that they're in the middle of, as it were, high political drama and often not doing terribly well. You'll see that it's unfinished because the first word is contingebat, but the capital C has not been added in. So the manuscript, um, at some stage, is just sort of abandoned um, in that initial phrase. And this is typical of the kind of historical content. Philip explained that I'm a historian of warfare. I've not been writing a book on the Battle of Shrewsbury for years. Uh, and that's why I went to, to look at this, and that's what it actually says. Um, and just to pick up Michael's points about biblical sort of allusions, just suffusing these manuscripts, this is apparently a physical description of a battlefield, and as you read through it, you think, hang on a minute, what's the size of this hole? It's how many feet deep? Well, I think the Corps of Engineers with kit would struggle to dig that size of pit. Earlier on, you find out that this is an allusion uh, to the punishment for perjury, and it's about the star falling from, uh, from the heavens and creating uh, a pit for the damned, because that's where um, those who betrayed their loyalties uh, end up. So that's the kind of historical content that we have um, in um, the Manuscript. The Mortimer genealogy itself, not surprisingly, puts the Mortimer arms um, prominently on almost every single folio um, of uh, the manuscript. And we start um, up here, here are the illuminated capitals which are missed out. But this shows you the way in which the text is not continuous. So we have these uh, rambles here which have their own text. Uh, the genealogy runs for about 15 uh, folios. Two sorts of royalism, of course, not just royal connection with the English royal family, but also connection uh, with uh, the Welsh um, royal family as well. So this is um, the section in the middle here. Here begins the genealogy of uh, Gladys, um, the daughter and heir of uh, Prince Llewellyn, that's Llewellyn the Great, um, which is being so that too. So there are these two themes that run through the whole of the genealogy, connections to uh, a claim for, uh, for English royalty, but also a, a connection uh, to claims for Welsh uh, royalty. Uh, so this is the myth. And it is, as you will see, rather grandly illustrated and um, illuminated. Now, I said that Dugdale misses bits out. What he doesn't do, of course, and can't do, is tell you about how the page works. 
So this, as you would see, is a typical sort of page. Here are the Mortimer Arms, and here is another rather grand illumination. How was that actually put together? Well, here is our dragon in close-up, and you can see, by looking at the bits here, that the text is written first, and the illuminations are added second. So the text itself is planned. So there is, a, a, as it were, a compiling mind behind the text. Uh, and our dragon has been added in um, this um, pre-arranged space. I, I have this image of the creative tension between the scribe and the artist. <laughs> um, early in my career I worked on Doomsday and we had uh, the wonderfully named scribes known as Scribe A and Scribe B. Um, one was the rubricator who went and did all the highlights in red and the other was the scribe. <coughs> so there's clearly something going on here but it means that the text um, is itself uh, planned. But it was also altered um, at different stages. So, this section, um, which is about the marriage of Anne Mortimer to Richard Earl of Cambridge, so that's the crucial bit um, for the Yorkist claim. Um, it records the marriage on the 27th of December 1388, but it's added after 1415 because some of the details on the inside um, can only have been added um, during the course of the early 15th century. You'll see if you look carefully here as well that some of these randalls look as if they've had a cup of coffee spilled over them. In reality they've been scraped and new text has been added um, inside the randalls. Now what that means is that this text needs a proper edition because it needs to be, first of all, can you see what's been scratched out? Um, but also what's being added, what's being um, taken away um, in, um, in some sort of uh, fashion. There are also additions over erasures. So this one, for example, uh, again deals with uh, Lionel Duke of Clarence. And you can see here, so um, this is a reference uh, that's been uh, added over here. We have Richard II. Um, here's the gap. Um, now, they are different hands um, between uh, the two lines. Um, they're not hugely different, so if you look at letter forms, that's that thing that looks like a word, <coughs> uh, which is a W, is not vastly different um, from the W that's here uh, for Walsingham. Um, so the manuscript itself um, has all these bits, um, which are, I think, pretty crucial to any uh, study of it um, in itself. Here's a close-up of that uh, example of, of bits where we've got um, a much longer text, which has now been reduced to a much uh, smaller one. So these are the heirs of Roger Mortimer, uh, died in 1330, the um, putative lover uh, of Queen Isabel. There are also marginal additions. Um, so we've got here, um, so this is a wrangle for um, the Beach and Earls of Warwick, um, and you get a little comment in the bottom, uh, as well as little ones here, primogenitus at first, and bits of text that Dugdale doesn't give because they were too faded even in the 17th century um, for uh, writing um, in um, properly. Now, who does it? who actually compiles um, this manuscript. Uh, traditionally, historians have liked the look of this chap, a chap called John Other Lake, um, who is known to have been March Herald in the 1390s. He doesn't appear in the record after 1395, and we know clearly that the manuscript is being added to in the early 15th century. So he's a possible candidate, but it's not conclusive. I think the work for a possible um, compiler of this manuscript has to be much more um, carefully undertaken, and it's not work that I've myself um, as yet done. Um, now, a second thought is to look, well, okay, what does the manuscript contain? What kinds of stuff does it contain? A herald 
was always a good choice because lots of the information in it is of a heraldic variety. But there are other possibilities. So for example, if we look at this page, a certain chronicle says, that's how this section uh, begins, uh, but what follows, so this, is actually a verbatim copy of a letter patent um, about the grant of Nucleus Castle um, in my Lineth. Um, so th the compiler has access to a range of records uh, which may well reveal uh, his identity. Equally, we are looking at someone who's in possession of material that only the master of time in a religious house would have access to. And the master of time is a sacristan. That's the chap that works out the day of Easter. And when they write chronicles, they show off like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. What they tell you, so for example, um, Edmund Mortimer, the one who's involved in Battle Green Glass, uh, we're told in his, run, uh, in his little roundel uh, that the said Edmund was born at Ludlow uh, on the 5th Ides of November. On the Monday, at the 19th hour, the dominical letter D, in the feast of St. Theodore the Martyr, in the year of our Lord 1377, and the reign of Edward III, the 51st, and the 28th of his reign in France. In other words, you get three lines um, of this complicated dating process. You know, and you, you know, as a historian, you sit at your desk with Cheney's handbook of dates with your fingers in, you know, going backwards and forwards to work out, well, actually, what day is this then? That's often a, the sign of a, someone who's got evidence uh, that's connected with the sacrist's office uh, in a, a religious house patronised uh, by um, the Mortimer family. Now, I want to finish off very quickly by thinking, well, OK, is this a comprehensive view of um, the Mortimers? And just thinking of this context, late 14th, early 15th century, what doesn't the Mortimer genealogy tell us about? And it doesn't tell us about quite a number of things. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about these, uh, these four things, not necessarily in that order. Uh, Roger Mortimer, who dies in 1330, of course, well, where's he buried? Is he buried in Coventry? Is he buried um, in Shrewsbury? Um, what the Chronicle doesn't tell us is what's revealed in this petition. This is the petition of Joan Mortimer to have his body back in 1332, uh, which interestingly has a note, which must be the king's words, if not the king's hand, let the body rest in peace again. In other words, let it be exhumed and removed, uh, possibly from, uh, from Coventry, because within the text here, uh, we have a reference to the Friars Minor um, of Coventry. Here's Coventry picking out. So that doesn't feature. This little dispute as to about the body doesn't um, feature um, in the... Um, in the Mortimer genealogy. Neither does much detail about Edmund Mortimer's involvement in the Battle of Bryn Glass uh, in 1402. Um, I'm actually rather pleased that I didn't include here um, all the bits about that battle that refer to um, masculine parts, because you might feel that you'd had rather enough um, of that kind of illusion uh, now. Um, it appears in a number of, uh, of chronicles. This is uh, the Evesham Chronicle, but it also um, appears um, elsewhere. So it also appears um, in this manuscript from Cambridge, um, compiled in Oxford, probably, um, rather than Cambridge, by um, Michael Nicholas Bishop. Um, and we have um, a marginal heading here that just says um, Edmundus Mortimer Bellum Wallier. Edmund Mortimer, War in Wales. Uh, and it's an account, a quite lengthy account, of the Battle of Green Glass, including um, topographical detail, reference to the spring, um, etc. In the Mortimer genealogy, we get one line. Nothing of that that's actually involved. And of course, the other thing uh, that is never, ever mentioned in the Mortimer <laughs> genealogy. <laughs> Whenever one 
talks about the tripartite denture, which is, must be the height of Mortimer hubris, which is to claim lordship as kings of part of uh, the British Isles, the tripartite indenture of 1405. The problem is that you can't talk about it except thinking of it as some fantastical piece of nonsense, because you know what happens. Uh, those of you who listened to um, In Our Time a couple of weeks ago on Away in Glyndor will have heard the discussion of it there. You just relabel a map and it's extraordinary how plausible it looks. So, you know, you have to put yourself back at the beginning of the 15th century and think, would the tripartite indenture, of which those are the borders, would that have been um, so improbable? I want to finish off, however, with, again, something that doesn't appear in um, the Mortimer genealogy in a Chicago manuscript. And that's what happens to the very last of um, the Mortimers, the fifth uh, Earl uh, Edmund, of course, who arrives uh, in very unpropitious circumstances at the end of uh, the 14th, beginning of the 15th century. He's kept in captivity, he's released. Um, um, he may be involved in not one but two attempted rebellions. He changes his mind and, uh, and peaches on all the other conspirators. Um, he makes his way back. Now, where does he choose to patronise? Where does he choose to be buried? Not at Wigmore, not at anywhere in the Welsh March. What he does between 1415 and 1423 is that he founds a chantry college, the archetypal late medieval form for family devotion and prayer to the memory of the family. They're ubiquitous in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. Um, you establish a college with uh, canons and vicars, you prescribe the form of liturgy, and your body is buried in the choir of the church with the canons and the vicars sat on either side in the style of a small uh, monastic establishment. Edmund Mortimer eschews the Welsh march and the Mortimer claims in the West and instead focuses on part of the inheritance um, from the Clares, obviously, um, in Suffolk by founding this Chantry College. The church survives. Um, it even has medieval wall paintings uh, in its surviving. Um, the college survives as a memory because there is an adjacent um, school called Mortimer College, which, with which I'm sure some of you uh, are familiar. And the college records, which are very poor uh, and survive uh, in rather unpleasant um, forms, preserves his epitaph. So here um, is the manuscript in Corpus Christi College in Cambridge. Um, it's up, you're looking at it upside down. So the manuscript, this is the top of the manuscript here with all this stuff. But here on the left is the epitaph of the, the last of the Mortimer Earls, together with, just up here, a reference to the fact that he is tumulati in Coro Collegi. He is buried in the choir of the college. That's 1425. The Mortimer genealogy is being worked on in the 1420s and later, probably into the reign of Edward IV, um, because there are additions there. But this bit of the Mortimer genealogy is not there. Why it's not there, I see to be in part penitential. That is to say, the Mortimers are saying, our ambitions have been in the West. I am a changed man. I will focus my patronage here in the soft and safe counties of East Anglia, where I can be no threat um, to Henry V and to his son, Henry VI. I've, t I've told you much of what I'm sure you know, but I hope I might have given you some indication that there is much of interest to be discovered from a careful study of the Chicago manuscript, which many of you can undertake yourselves because the digital imaging is very, very good. Thank you very much.
we've got time for a few questions before the uh, refreshment conference break. Uh, are, are there any questions to either Michael or to Philip? For those who couldn't hear, the question is, what, how, how did the documents end up in Chicago? Uh, they were sold. Um, so they were in a private um, library in Britain in the 1920s, I think, um, and they were sold. So Mary Giffin's PhD was looking at a manuscript that the university had just acquired. But the traffic in, as it were, English manuscripts particularly, in the first half of the 20th century was phenomenal. So there are English manuscripts all over the United States. You know, being nicely looked after, nicely digitised, the question is just um, in, in reference to uh, the fall of uh, Roger Mortimer, his execution by Edward, the, uh, by Edward III, uh, and the impact of that on the family and how that is reflected uh, in the family chronicle writings. I mean, just on, on the, the chronicles of uh, Edward III's reign, I, I, I think Generally speaking, those later chronicles are very critical of, of Roger Mortimer and, and Isabella. The one that, that I quoted from there, the, the Flores Historiarum, is unusual in that it appears to have been written before his downfall and is an unusual one in that it is uh, very much praising him as well as being critical of, of Edward II. Who were the people reading uh, no. the, the chronicles? Right, I, I, I wouldn't dare to give uh, even, even an approximation because there has been a lot of debate about this. But of course it changed over time. So uh, from the late 12th century onwards, you certainly have a lot more lay literacy. Um, and there's also this, there really is a difference in quality very often. This is putting it quite generally between those chronicles that are written in Latin and those chronicles that are written in French. So for example, you start to get from the late 12th century chronicles that are written with an aristocratic audience in mind. Sometimes they might be in verse, they could be song and, and so on. And that's a, that is a different audience very often to the, to the monastic audience. And I think that there's, there's a difference often with the family history uh, and, say, monastic history. You're talking about quite different audiences. So which, which candidates are the ladies who, who might have been patrons of the uh, Mortimer Chronicles? I just think it's worth looking, and given um, the status of, as it were, the male bit of, of the family, given that they're young and so on, um, then I'd be looking for a widow um, in particular. I mean, I, I think you could say that in, um, in most um, aristocratic male, well, all male lineages, the weakest link is a woman. Because, but that does mean that women are the last guardians of a family history. And they're often uh, that bit of, of the family that transmits one um, history um, to its successor. Um, history. So it's, it's somebody in that kind of position. Uh, to an audience like this, I hesitate to put a name there because, of course, it'll, it'll multiply on Tinternet. Um, and I'll get you know, members of the society who aren't here will be writing to me and saying, oh, you said X. So, so I haven't really got a name, which sounds a bit of a dodge. Uh, and that, of course, is because it is a dodge. So. Okay, do you think it could have been more than you just do unspeakable things to dismember bodies? <laughs> Well, dismembering bodies is, uh, if you want the later, those of you who read Malcolm Price's novels, uh, the Battle of Bring Glass is cited twice in Aberystwyth, Mon Amour. So, so if you want to follow it up. Uh, 